Great. I am very excited to be here today to talk to you about one of my favorite topics, reference population databases. Just to give you a little background, when we sequence one person's exome, we actually are sequencing about 20,000 human genes, and we find 20 to 30,000 protein coding variants. It varies depending on the person's ancestry. And what we're looking for from a rare disease perspective, which isn't the only use of exome sequencing, obviously, but the, the perspective I come from, is we're looking for one or two pathogenic variants. And what do I mean by pathogenic variants? These are disease-causing variants in, in the like changes in the sequence that cause disease. Um, and we use this to contrast with benign variants, or which are the old terminology for that was polymorphisms. So we kind of we go through all this data and we look through it. Um, I will just mention that Daniel MacArthur has a primer from 2017 that's on the same topic that is a, a broader view and as a lot of the research applications of, of what we can do with databases. What I'm going to be talking to you about today is really how to use one of the largest population reference databases um, in very high detail so that you should all come out of this able to feel comfortable using this database. So what is in an exome? If I were to sequence any of our exomes from this room today, we would find many rare, potentially functional variants. We all have about 500 rare missense variants, and about a third of them are predicted damaging by in silico predictors. So in silico predictors are things like polyphen, SIFT, CAD, there's many of these these days. And they're computational tools that look at a variant, they might look at conservation, they look, might look at how big the amino acid changes biochemi biochemically or other properties, and they try to predict whether a variant is going to damage the protein structure or function or whether it's going to be tolerated. And so those are very, you know, those are great goals. Those are they're very useful tools to have. But given that about a third of our variants are still predicted to be damaging, we're obviously not able to just highlight our pathogenic variants with these predictors yet. We all have about 100 loss of function variants. So variants that disrupt the protein um, are, are places we might think that these could be important, but we all have 100 of them. About 20 are homozygous, so we're all knockout for about 20 genes, and we have about 20 very rare uh, loss of function variants. We have 100 rare variants in known disease genes. Rare, I tend to mean about like less than 1% allele frequency in the general population. So that's a, a, lot, a lot of variants also to look at there. When we first started making these large preference databases, we found that everyone in the general population had over 50 variants that had been reported as disease-causing in a clinical database, like the Human Gene Mutation Database or ClinVar. Obviously, you've all made it here today, so you must not have 50 disease-causing variants because we're all functioning very well. And what it turned out was going on was that we used to sequence people who came into clinic with rare disease. We would look at you know, the genes we knew were associated with disease, and we said, oh, if you have a variant that's not seen in 50 or 100 Europeans, that, that must be what is causing your disease. But it turns out a lot of those variants were ancestral variants, so they were common in East Asians or common in Latino, and we were confusing those ancestry-related variants with disease variants. And so the databases are starting to get somewhat cleaned up, and it's getting much, much better over time, particularly with current modern criteria for variant interpretation, which I'll briefly touch on. We all have one or two de novo protein coding mutations, so that's a new mutation in us. And then we have an unknown number of sequencing errors. So my, our goal as a sort of clinical geneticist or a rare disease exome analysis is to find these pathogenic genetic variants within this sea of benign variation. This is obviously the approach we would like to take. We would like to just be able to like see where that variant is and, and know it right away. This is our current approach. Um, it actually works pretty well. We're able to make a diagnosis in about 30% of cases, but it requires digging through um, the exome variant data until we kind of look like this and, and find what we're looking for. I think many of you, at least who I work with, are very familiar with this feeling. So one of the ways that we, one of the things that has really completely changed the field is what we're going to talk about today. It's using the large general population and harnessing the power of population allele frequency to compare against the exome of one individual. So you can tell which variants are common, which variants are rare, and which variants are extremely rare. And so what I focus on is these rare alleles. 
Um, but really, we can, the, the databases contain along the whole allele frequency spectrum, all the common variants, and down to the very rare variants. Um, but a lot of what we're talking about today is looking for rare variants that have very large effect size. And so if you have that rare variant, you will have the disease. So these are the uh, general reference population databases. These are the main ones that are available. So some of the early ones were the 1,000 Genomes Project, um, which was an ancestrally diverse reference population database, about 26 ancestries that were sequenced. And this was a, a really great initial reference, um, but it's a very small database. Next was the Exome Sequencing Project that sequenced uh, about 6,000, a mixture of Europeans and African Americans. Um, there's some. Sometimes I hear that this is a healthy population, but it's actually um, the same kind of general population that we see in uh, EXAC and NOMAD that we'll talk about, but it includes people with cardiovascular disease and other types of common disease. The Discover EHR cohort is a really interesting cohort. It's from um, a collaboration between the pharmaceutical company Regeneron and the healthcare system Geisinger in Western Pennsylvania, and they have sequenced a, a large proportion, up to 50,000, uh, their exome sequence of their of the healthcare population there, um, and they have made an aggregate data set. What's really exciting about this data set, it's connected to health medical records, so they're able to um, learn interesting things about human biology. We don't use it as a reference population because over half of the individuals in that, in that healthcare system are related to each other, and that would be a very biased way to look at allele frequencies. Um, but it's an interesting data set. EXAC, or the Exome Aggregation Consortium data set, is the largest, uh, was the first, for a while, was the largest publicly available data set. It was released in October 2014. Um, this is work led by Daniel MacArthur's lab, which is who I work with. And so it was, the, it was much more ancestrally diverse and all exome data, about 60,000. Bravo is currently the largest whole genome data set that's publicly available. Um, they have a site also that's worth checking out. It's through the TopMed study funded by NHLBI. And then NOMAD is the majority of what I'm going to talk about today, although I will touch on some analysis that was done on EXAC um, that we haven't gotten to on NOMAD yet. Um, and basically, this is now the largest reference population database. It has data, exome or genome data, from over 140,000 individuals. It has, um, it's been provided by 109 different, actually 110 different PIs now. Um, and they basically, these are studies that were already happened, many at the Broad, um, and we, and what Daniel, did is he formed this consortium, got all of these PIs to agree to share their data with this project, and then all the data was run through the same pipeline and jointly called to make one giant, very high quality data set. The actual whole data set is available for download. I don't suggest you do that because it's a huge, um, they're huge files, um, but if you have a, if you're setting up a diagnostic pipeline or a research pipeline, you can, then you download those and you can annotate all of your data with, with the NOMAD data. Um, we are not able to share individual level data. We don't have consent for that. These are studies that were already done for other reasons that we're, that we're using for, for this data set. Um, these are not samples that were sequenced for NOMAD. And we don't have consent information on these individuals. It's, Pretty evenly balanced, but 55% male. The mean age is 54 years, so these are mostly adults. There are some, a few individuals under 18 in the data set. There are cases and controls from common disease studies. We don't knowingly include any cohorts that were recruited for pediatric onset disease, but that doesn't mean that there couldn't be some individual with pediatric onset disease who participates in an adult, adult study. Um, there's lots of type 2 diabetes, there's schizophrenia and bipolar, there's GI disease, there's cardiovascular disease, there's a whole number of diseases, but there's con cases and controls. And one of the nice things is because there's so many different cohorts in here that a lot of the effects from any individual cohort are really washed out in the whole data set. So we have a pretty good represent general representation of the population. We report both the allele frequency for each variant, but also something called pop max, and that is the highest allele frequency in any of these subpopulations, but we only use continental populations, so we use Europeans, South Africans, sorry, sorry, not South Africans, Europeans, South Asians, East Asians, Africans or African Americans, and Latino as our general populations for pop max. You can go and you can download all the data, as I mentioned. There, the exome data and the genome data is actually processed in parallel and kept separately. 
I want to highlight a common misconception that I've been hearing about. A lot of people are downloading the exome data if they're interested in studying coding regions, but they're, they're downloading the genome data if they're interested in studying everything. The exome data has 125,000 individuals with exomes. The genome data has, has 15,000 individuals with genomes, and so you're only looking at a subset of the data if you download e e either of those files. There is no file that merges the exome and genome data together. They're, they're separate. So if you're only going to do one, I guess you would do the exome data, but it's better to work with both. And the exome data just because it's a larger sample size. This is the, um, this is how we determine, a little bit about how we determine ancestries. So Laurent Francioli did this work. This is the principal component analysis that's showing you the different ancestry groups. Um, so you can see this is done by a random forest machine learning approach. So we are not having self-reported ancestries where we're determining from the genetic data. And so what happens here is you have Europeans in orange over here, and the Finnish and Ashkenazi Jewish are the two blue samples that are coming, uh, that are nearby. We have the South Asian samples up here. The East Asian are over here. The Latino down here and the African are over there. And so the way this is computed is we have individuals that we know their ancestry. We see where they fall on this map, give them a color, and then we figure out who falls near them. You'll also notice these arcs between. These are admixture. Um, so that means there are individuals in the data set who might have you know, one African parent and one um, South Asian parent, and so then you're seeing the admixture between those. We also, in this data set, remove any low-quality samples, anyone with sex chromosome abnormalities like Turner syndrome or Kleinfelter. We also, and really importantly, remove first and second degree relatives so that we shouldn't have um, any inflation of our, we shouldn't have very much inflation of our, of our allele frequencies because of relatedness. Uh, Conrad Karczewski and Grace Chow, along with others, have been working on subpopulations in this data set using a, a, a fun way to represent this called UMAP that I've shown you the bioarchive link there. And there's also more information about this in the Nomad release blog post on the MacArthur Lab site. Um, but basically, you can see the different subpopulations that are broken out here. Uh, the size of it has, in, has more, is more to do with the representation of each population in the data set, uh, not like in the world. And the, you can't go too much by how close the populations are together, um, but it just kind of shows you the different subpopulations we're able to break out. Okay, so now we're going to take cystic fibrosis as our example gene to really dive into what, what information is available about a gene and about each variant in this data set. So just to review, cystic fibrosis is an autosomal recessive disorder. You need two mutations to have the disease. You need one from your mother and one from your father. Uh, if you only have one pathogenic variant in this disease, sorry, in this gene, then you, have, you are a carrier for cystic fibrosis. So the, all this information, well, I've talked about the downloads. The way I access it is actually through a website that was built to make it so anyone can, can have this information easily at their fingertips. It's incredibly easy to use. I highly recommend you check it out. You just go to nomad.broadinstitute.org. When you get to this page, there's a bar. You can type in a gene name. You can type in a variant. Um, you can do region searches. This, is, uh, this browser was initially set up by Konrad Karczewski and Ben Weisberg, um, but recently Matt Solomonson has taken over the lead on this and has redesigned the new face of the, no, the new face and work and functionality of the Nomad browser. And Nick Watts is another software engineer who's joined the team and been working on this a lot. So this is the cystic fibrosis gene here. There's a lot of information on this page. The first thing you're, I'm going to draw your attention to, these black bars here, these are the exons. The introns are represented between them. The introns are obviously not drawn to scale. They're much bigger than that. Um, but this is really, all the data is in here, but you, we're really just showing you the data around the exons. This arrow over here tells you if it's a forward or reverse strand gene. So this is a forward strand gene. These little blue mountains above the exons are the coverage, uh, so how many reads we have um, for each sample, uh, sorry, for the samples on average in the exome data in blue. And so you can see that we kind of have more in the middle and then it, there's sort of, there's some, some fall off at the edges. And in green, where you see much flatter across the whole way, that's the coverage of the data in the genome data. And there are genomes we generally do to about 30x, and so that's about what you see here. 
So there's other information on here. You have the ensemble ID up here, the number of variants we see. On each page, there's always a, a link that you can just click, and you can go right to this gene or variant on the UCSC genome browser. You can look up the gene in um, a clinical database, OMIM. Um, we're going to talk about this table later. We actually have all the ClinVar variant pathogenic and, um, sorry, pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants that are in the ClinVar database, which is a, a database where clinical labs put their interpretations of genetic variants in. Just to really point out, this is the variants that are in, in that clinical database. Many of these, maybe most of these, may not be in the NOMAD data set. So we don't have those, that linked yet. This is just to kind of show you where we see disease variants in, this, in, in each gene. This row here is actually showing, this is kind of noisy, it's, but it's showing you um, the different variants that we see. So we see a ton of variation in every gene, basically, of the human genome that does vary to some degree, but we see lots of variation in, across the human population. Um, and red is the loss of function variants, and yellow is the missense variants, and green is the synonymous, and non-coding are in gray. And the height of the bar has to do with the allele frequency. Um, below that, you can choose if you only want to look at a subset of the data, so you can only look at loss of function or only missense, or you can pick and choose among those. And then at the bottom is a long table, and it's a list of every variant we see in this gene. I will say that we do quality control on this, and so the variants that are shown are only the variants that are passing our strict QC metrics. There are other, we don't, we don't, I mean, everything is there in the VCF. We don't throw anything out. And so if you wanted to see everything in the VCF, including the variants that fail the QC, then you just check this box to include filtered variants. So we have the variant listed here, the chromosome, the coordinate, the reference sequence, the alternate sequence, whether we see it in an exome or a genome. The consequence, this is the beginning of the gene, so these are all in the UTR, so they're non-coding. The annotation tells you they're in the UTR. The allele count is the number of times we see the variant in the 140,000 people. The allele number is the number of chromosomes that we have confidently have high quality genotypes on. So this is 250,000 is the number of chromosomes, and for an autosomal gene, we have two copies of that chromosome, so the number of individuals is this number divided by two. The allele frequencies are the allele counts divided by the allele number, and we also show the number of homozygotes if there are any. You can search for any variant using this nice search bar. I wanted to look up the phenylalanine 508 DEL variant, which is the most common um, variant, uh, pathogenic variant for cystic fibrosis. When I type that in, you'll see that there are five variants within that single uh, codon, and I am interested in that first one, so I click over here to go to the variant page. Um, when you type this in, it actually also shows you where in the gene it falls. That's sometimes helpful. This is what the variant page, every variant page looks like. There's tons of information on here. I'm going to zoom in on some of it. Some of the things I'm going to ignore, but are here are some of the quality metrics if you wanted to dive into that, and some of the information about the different annotations on different transcripts. So kind of smush this into one page just to show you some of the features that I want to highlight. This is the allele counts in exomes and in genomes. We have those separated in the allele frequencies. In the top right-hand corner of both the gene page, but also every variant page, we have now subsets of NOMAD. If you're studying a patient with some type of neurologic disease and you're worried that, the, that there's somebody in a NOMAD who has your variant um, and you're worried that maybe they're in one of the cohorts for like adult neurologic disease, you can actually choose the non-neuro, same for non-cancer, or the control-only data set and see um, if your variant is, is in the, one of these subsets. So you have, there are some subsets you can use. Um, for most things, I just use all of NOMAD. Um, also, there are some overlap of samples between top med and NOMAD, and so that's why that option is there. We have age histograms, so you can see the age of people who have the variant. Uh, this, these are all rounded ages. And then we have um, the IGV web view, sorry, the IGV browser, so you can look and see the actual raw read supports for the variants to see if you think the variant is real, if there are any issues there. So this is really the heart of the page, is the allele, fre is the allele frequencies um, broken down by different ancestry groups. And this I just want to use as an example. So this is, again, the most common pathogenic variant for cystic fibrosis. We know that the carrier frequency of cystic fibrosis is very high in Europeans, and actually one in 25 Euro Europeans is a carrier for cystic fibrosis. I'm only looking at one variant. I don't want to like take them all and add them up, so I'm just looking at this one variant, and we know from databases that about one in 40 Europeans is a carrier for this variant. 
So I wanted to ask how well does Nomad work as a representation of the general population? So for Europeans, I took the number of chromosomes we see from here, I divide by two chromosomes per person, I get the number of Europeans that are genotyped at this site, I multiply that by one in 40, and I get 1,612 carriers that I expect, and I see 1,598, so it's working very well. Um, you can d look at interesting things like in East Asians, we actually don't ever see this, this common this common carrier variant in Europeans, we never see this in the about 9,000 East Asians that we've genotyped at this site. And then if you were interested in subpopulations, you just click this arrow and you can open up this and you can see the, the, the allele counts and the allele frequencies in different subpopulations and you can also see how many males and females for each one. Um, in general, when we, do free, when we do filtering, we tend to use the Euro full European because you worry a little bit about using subpopulations that there could be founder effects or other smaller effects. And so, um, but it, if something were seen in 10% of Swedish or something, that would, that would make me somewhat reassured that it wasn't a pathogenic variant. So the information is helpful, but for the most part, we use the larger classes for when we think about filtering. Now we expect, I'm not going to show you the math, but uh, by Hardy-Weinberg, we expect to see 10 homozygotes in, out of the 64,000 Europeans in this data set. And so how many do we actually see? We see one homozygote. And actually, if you'd asked me, I would have predicted that there would be zero homozygotes in the NOMAD data set. And that's because, as I already told you, we haven't included any cohorts that recruit for pediatric onset disease. And so I wouldn't think there would necessarily be anyone with cystic fibrosis in this data set. But also, I can't say for 100% that we would have really excluded everyone because there's so many different types of studies in here. It's possible that someone with cystic fibrosis could participate in another type of study. I was curious because uh, type 2 diabetes is known to be, at your, if you have cystic fibrosis, you're at increased risk, and so I thought maybe they would participate in that study by accident. Um, but actually, when we look at, um, we're able to tell, um, let's see, oh, sorry, before I get to that. The first thing you want to do is you want to say, is this homozygous person, is that variant real? Because if it's just a sequencing artifact, then it's not as interesting. And so you go to the read data and you look, and so we have a three base pair deletion there, We've got tons of coverage, looks very clean. I don't have any concerns about that that I can raise from the sequence data. So it looks real. So what's going on? So I looked in and saw that this person is actually in the control subset data set. So they seem to be a control in whatever study they're participating in. Um, so that's interesting. And it's possible that this individual may not be penetrant for the condition. And that's a way that we can find people who are, have potentially really interesting biology that we might be interested in and in doing like modifier studies or other studies to figure out why they're not penetrant. Um, I, I will say if you go to cystic fibrosis clinics and talk to physicians there, they will say they have encountered people who aren't penetrant for cystic fibrosis with these um, mutations that are normally considered completely penetrant. So this is a known phenomenon that's happening, and modifiers have been found in actually one of the sodium channels. Um, so it's just an interesting thing you can think about with these databases, although really more like biobanks where you're able to reconnect with the participants are where these studies are the most powerful. Um, NOMAD is really not meant to find that one individual and, and connect with them and do additional studies. There is a database that does is trying to do that. It's called Geno2MP. I just wanted to mention it briefly. It has about 10,000 rare disease patient exome data in it, um, and it's for it's where you can you can go and you can look up your variant of interest, and you can actually click on the variant and you can get one or two HPO high level phenotype terms associated um, with that variant. And so if you were studying a new disease gene or looking for individuals that are, so these are people with rare disease, so it's not a healthy population. Um, but this is a place you can go and, and you know, find if your variant's in there, you can find out what it's associated with. It's helpful for ruling out a lot of variants. This is an intellectual disability gene, so this person has a, a skeletal system abnormality, so I would not think that would be pathogenic. But if you're interested, you can always contact the person who has the case. Okay, so we looked at this. I told you I thought it looks good. Um, hoping most of you agree. One of the questions I get is, well, that's fine to tell me that looks good, but what, what should I be looking for? What looks bad? So I'm going to show you some examples. So these are the things we're going to consider. The first is, 
just some flags I want you to be aware of. So the low confidence loss of function, these are variants that are sort of predicted to be loss of function. They might be nonsense variants, but there's some reason that the lofty tool, which is the tool developed by Conrad Karczewski and Daniel MacArthur, there's some reason that the tool uh, has flagged that this might, be not, might not be causing loss of function. Sometimes these are variants are, that are in exons that don't seem to be well conserved and aren't really part of the main transcript. Other times these are, um, Variants that are nonsense variants in the last exon, for example, wouldn't be expected to trigger nonsense mediated decay, and so those get flagged. It's a computational prediction, so it doesn't mean it won't cause loss of function. Just like a variant that the VC that is, is called stop gained at the top and not flagged, it doesn't mean it absolutely will cause loss of function. Human interpretation, experimental studies are needed on top of this, but at least it's something to be aware of. This is a region that doesn't look very good. If I if you know one of these was a variant I was interested in, and this is what the region looked like, I, I would be very concerned that there are sequencing errors here. And what's, what you're noticing is there's many variants in, in the region. They have different, in, different allele balances, so some are in very low allele balance, some are in more, there's an insertion there too. This is just like, there's a lot going on here. That raises my concern. This is actually a low copy repeat. There are mapping issues here. This is probably a mapping artifact, um, and so you would not want to think of that as real. And so these are low copy repeats are actually flagged, but anytime you see a lot going on like that, um, I would be cautious of it. Homopolymers. So that's where you have like a stretch of a single nucleotide in a row. These are hard for PCR to get through. They tend to make errors where they might insert a G or delete a G, it can be any letter. And so these are common PCR artifact regions, but they're also regions that the human DNA polymerase has trouble also. So they're places where you can get real sequence variants. Um, so they're just, uh, I just want to highlight that you need to be cautious of these. Um, and you definitely want to be saying or validating these if you're, if you're interested in them. Multinucleotide variants are interesting. Those are when you, so the VCF actually calls each of these variants separately. Um, but really, when they're in cis, you should be interpreting them together if they're within the same codon as these two are. These are actually flagged in the Nomad browser now. Um, and I'm going to show you that in the next slide. But I will also point out that the same kind of thing can happen with an, a complex indel. You can have a deletion of one base, and then a few, amino, sorry, a few nucleotides later, you can have an insertion of one base, and you basically keep the frame then, and you probably will end up with two synonymous or missense variants. Um, but those are going to be called two frame shifts by the VCF. And so you need to kind of put those back together, and, and we don't have those flagged in Nomad. But you should see they should pop out when you look at the read data. So MANIVs, or multinucleotide variants, are flagged in the browser here. This is what they look like on the page. Um, there's this warning that it's um, a MANIV. And then if you click this more info, it shows you this box where you can see the two variants. You can see how they're interpreted separately and how they're interpreted combined. And so this was called a nonsense variant. It's a gene associated with severe intellectual disability. And so we weren't sure why we were seeing that in the NOMAD data set. But really, it's just it's a missense variant that is likely not pathogenic. Um, and the final thing here is skewed allele balance. Um, so we actually included, after lessons from XAC, we have now have a hard filter for an allele balance of 20% in the, the NOMAD data set. Um, so those are variants are still in the data set, but again, they're in that filtered view only. Um, but this one, for example, is in 21% and is a pathogenic variant for a severe pediatric onset intellectual disability disease. Um, so we were suspicious of it, and I think this is likely a somatic variant in NOMAD. Okay, the only reason way to be sure is to, to go back and like Sanger sequence it and get sort of different samples from the person. So we can't do any of that, but just that I would be suspicious of it. The other thing to check, it's a little bit less of an issue in Nomad now that we have genome data, but if a variant is absent from the data set, is it really absent? There's a few different things that could be happening. The first is that you might be looking at the H HGVS nomenclature, and you might be looking at like a transcript and a, you know, like a p-dot notation, and it might be that your variant is actually displayed differently in the Nomad browser, and so you might be looking in the wrong place. So it's very important that you're looking at the, the, the actual position you think you're looking at. Chromosome coordinates are the best way to do that, and so we're trying to get encouraged diagnostic labs. I encourage all of you, if you get diagnostic reports, to ask your diagnostic labs to put the actual chromosome coordinates on the report so you know you're looking at the right thing. Um, otherwise, you can put your HDVS into to, like mutation taste or a mutilizer, and you can figure out what your position is. 
The second is the position might not, well, no, might not be well covered in Nomad. In XSAC, that was definitely an issue. High GC content areas or regions that just weren't um, on the exome capture were not covered. And so to say that your variant is absent from a data set when there's no data there is meaningless. So you don't want to be doing that. And the third is the variant is actually absent, is not present in the 140,000 people, and that's, that is more interesting. The way I kind of, if I want to look up and make sure a variant isn't, uh, is, has good coverage but isn't in the data set, the cheat I do to do it quickly is I, you know, this is an example variant, this is the chromosome coordinate, I do a region search just on the, I don't worry about the C to A, but I just do a search on the region. I look for the nearby variant, so there's actually another variant in this codon, and then I look at the allele number, um, so the number of chromosomes genotyped at that position, or just someone somewhere near one that is nearby. And so while this isn't, I can't say it's absent from 140,000 people, I can say it's absent from about 32,000 people, which is still like a very reasonable thing to say it's a rare variant. Um, I wanted to point out a, a little bit of a, just sort of a, it's it just a thing that's happening with how the data is represented. Um, the genome and exome data is represented separately, and so, sorry, is, is processed separately, and so you'll see that all of these variants are in exome, some are also in genomes, and so the allele number is in, you know, 250,000 range. This variant is only in the genome, only identified in the genomes, and so the, it looks like the allele number drops there, um, but that's because it's only found in the, the genome VCF, not in the exome VCF. And so it just gets represented incorrectly. Um, we've left this as it is. We think people can just kind of look around it, mostly because the way to fix this is to sort of change the browser to represent something different than the VCFs represent, which we worry is going to cause confusion. And the second way to do it is to actually edit the VCFs, which is just, like, shouldn't be done. <laughs> so um, where this is just a caveat to be aware of. You when I interpret this variant, I would interpret the coverage as the coverage of the variants in the, in the, of the 250,000. There's no reason to think that the coverage is dropping over this site. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just because it's only in the, in the one data set. Um, all the coverage data for, the, for all Nomad is here and that you can download and use in, in your pipeline so you're not having to look up every variant by hand. Um, but if you have a single diagnostic report, this is an easy way to look it up. Okay, using reference population databases in clinical variant interpretation. I'm gonna show you um, a little bit about how we think about variant interpretation. Our, every variant I get, is, it's kind of in a state of a variant of uncertain significance is how you start, and what you're trying to figure out is it, um, do we have evidence that it is a, doesn't cause disease, that it's benign, or evidence that it's pathogenic? And our evidence are these standards and guidelines that are published by Richards et al. Um, from the American College of Medical Genetics. These are the guidelines that we use, and I'm actually just going to focus on this population data here. And so I have zoomed in on that line so you can actually read it. And what we're looking for is, is the variant too common in the general population to be consistent, to be causing the, your disease? Is it absent or very rare in a population database? Or is it like, over, do you see it overrepresented in cases versus controls? Which is more of a case control study than um, strictly using a reference population database. I want to give a caveat here. We give this moderate evidence um, if a variant is absent in the reference population. However, the vast majority of variants are not found in, in NOMAD. So there's tons of variants in every gene in NOMAD, um, and, but overall we only see about 10% of the possible variation in the data set. And that doesn't mean that the 90% of variation that's absent is disease causing. I mean, nobody is suggesting that. However, when we see a rare variant and it's in a, 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 a gene that we know is associated with disease, that's a type of variant that causes disease, it raises our suspicion when it's absent in the general population. But it's possible that we're overcounting this a little, a little bit, and we're trying to think about ways that we can, can be a little smarter about that. So it's very useful, but I just I want to put a little bit of, of caution on that. When we use reference population databases, this is the power of them. So when we had 6,000 people, if we asked in a single person's exome how many variants were left if we removed everything that was, had an allele frequency greater than 1 in 1,000 or greater than 0.1%. When we used the 6,000 people in, a, in the ESP database that has Europeans and African Americans, we saw that you had 600 to almost 1,000 variants that were left. 
You can see this database was built, has, has Europeans and African Americans in it, and so it works best in those ancestries, and it works much less well in the other ancestries. Um, when we went to EXAC, which had 60,000 people and a much better ancestral representation, you can see that the number of variants left that are very rare is about 150, so it's helped a lot, but that's still 150 is a lot of rare variants to think about. And that's really going to 1 in 1,000. For recessive disease, you can have variants that are much more common than that. Um, but it really highlights the power of these databases. So this is an example genetic testing report that we get on patients. Um, and every report we get now should, should tell you how often this variant is seen in the general population. This is a known disease gene. It's a protein truncating variant where, loss, where haploinsufficiency is the mechanism of disease, the patient's phenotype fits, and the variant is not observed in the general population. So this way we're able to classify as pathogenic. Um, the opposite thing we do is we say the variant is too common in the general population to be causing disease. Most often these just are benign and so they, you don't even really see them on reports, but um, this was an example of a report. It's actually from 2015. The exact data set came out in 2014, but some labs were a little bit slow to really adopt it and get it into their workflow. And you'll notice that they don't comment on the reference population allele frequency in this report. And so anytime I see a report like that, I always look up the variant in, in Nomad, which I can do in like two or three minutes, basically, if that. And so this is um, the gene name here. This is the missense variant they see. It's heterozygous. They called it a variant of uncertain, sorry, they called it uncertain clinical significance, which I interpret as a variant of uncertain significance. And it's noted to be idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is autosomal dominant. And this is an adult onset disease. And I actually have a young child with developmental delay hypotonia and some uh, unclear respiratory issues that the pulmonologist actually sent this, this testing. Um, and so when I look up this variant in NOMAD, um, this is what I see. It's actually present in 3.6% of Europeans, 2.6% of everyone. Again, this is a dominant disease, so I wouldn't expect these kind of um, these high allele frequencies. Um, and these are the number of homozygotes, so 338 homozygotes in the general, pop sorry, in our in NOMAD population um, with this variant. So um, I felt that we were able to reclassify based on this information. Um, as benign. The other thing I will say is this variant is not conserved, so when you look here, um, it's not very well conserved, and you see it's actually a leucine in a number of um, cases, and this has actually been classified by another diagnostic lab and entered into ClinVar as benign. Okay, I'm going to talk about frequency filtering. So I've thrown out 1%, 0.1%, what allele frequency should we really be using? So this is the statistical approach that was developed by James Ware uh, uh, and Nikki Whiffen, who works with him. That they're at Imperial College London, but they have both spent a lot of time um, working with us here at the Broad also. Um, and then also Eric Minichel, who um, was a, in Daniel MacArthur's lab and now you know, has a, is a graduate student at the Broad working on prion disease. Um, okay, so this is published in Genetics and Medicine. I'm going to kind of go over it at a, a higher level and also how you use it. So the central tenet of this is the frequency of a pathogenic variant in a reference sample that's not selected for the condition you're studying should not exceed the prevalence of the condition. Very simple. So also reference population databases are a sampling of the general population. There are some exceptions to this. Founder mutations can confuse this bottleneck populations, balancing selection a little bit. And then the other thing is you need to take penetrance into consideration, because if you have something that's lowly penetrant, then the variant can exceed the, the prevalence of the condition. The other caveat here is we know that the stricter you can get with your filtering, the more likely you're going you're gonna to have variants that with higher odds ratio for, for developing disease. And so you want to get to as low allele frequency filtering as you can, because you're going to have fewer variants to look at. So I'm going to pick one variant just to kind of use this as, to go through, walk through this example. So this is a ClinVar variant that is uncertain significance. It's actually been classified by nine different labs. Um, and so we're going we're to talk about this one. Um, they all agree it's a variant of uncertain significance. And this is the allele frequency table for it. So it's seen in the general population, and, but it, it's not, there's no homozygotes, and it's not very common in, in any ancestry. But the other thing I need to tell you is that this is a variant for um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which you would expect to, to possibly see in a, a nomad population. Um, so it wouldn't be something that would be depleted as pediatric onset disease. Okay, so 
the, there's two pieces to this. So the first is calculating the meta, maximum credible population allele frequency. So you need to look at the genetic architecture of the condition to say how, how common do you think there should be variants for this condition in the population. That has to do with the prevalence of the condition, the genetic heterogeneity of the condition, which is the hardest thing to figure out, and the penetrance, which is also hard to figure out sometimes, but honestly, you can kind of hand wave. You don't have to be exact in it. OK, so we're going to use hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as our first example. So we know that about 1 in 500 people have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and that over the course of their life will develop it in the general population. Um, and this is a dominant condition, so they, you have two chromosomes, so that you do multiply by 1 half. We're going to call the penetrance for this condition 50%. I don't know exactly what it is. It varies on the variant, but 50% seems like a relatively conservative estimate. And then to estimate the genetic heterogeneity, what I'm going to do is just take the most common pathogenic allele that's known for this pretty well-studied disease. Not the allele frequency in the general population, but if you take a cohort of people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, what percent of those people will be, will their disease be explained by a certain variant? And the most common cause of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is this MYBPC3 variant that's seen in 2.2% of the population, but we're going to use 3% as the, as the upper confidence interval limit. So we're put 3% in there. So you can do that math, or and, and you get that number, 6 times 10 to the minus 5 is your maximum credible population allele frequency. The other thing you can do is you can go to this cardiodb.org allele frequency app, and you can just pick dominant disease, put your numbers in. You can, um, if you want to play and sort of say, well, what if I had 20% penetrance? What if I had 80% penetrance? And you can kind of see how it affects your numbers and decide what number you're going to go with. But these are the numbers we're going to use for this example. And then you're going to compare that to a filtering allele frequency, which is a little bit different than just the allele frequencies in NOMAD. If the variant, if the filtering allele frequency is larger than the maximum credible population allele frequency, then you're going to discard the variant. It's too common to be pathogenic. And if, it's, um, if this, this is not true, if the maximum credible population frequency is larger, then you're going to retain the variant. It could be pathogenic. This is just a filtering step. There are other things you're going to be doing. Um, but this is the filtering step. So what is the filtering allele frequency? When, why do we need it? The reason we need it is NOMAD is a sampling of the population. So the numbers in NOMAD are not the like, actual allele frequency of this variant across the entire world or across a single ancestry. Um, it's a sampling of a population. And so the filtering allele frequency is a conservative statistical adjustment because it's a sampling. It's the lower bound estimate of how rare a variant can still be, can be to be still compatible with a NOMAD observation. And I'm going to show you a picture that explains what that is. So the first thing is, the reason we know we need this is this is taking variants in the exome sequencing project. And if we take variants at 1% allele frequency in the exome sequencing project and we look at their actual frequency in exac, you can see it's kind of a Poisson distribution around 1%, even the same for like 0.1%. But when we take variants that are only seen once in that population, so one out of 6,000, they're not seen one out of 6,000 people in EXAC. They're actually often seen much less frequently. And actually, the majority of things that are seen once in ESP are not seen again in EXAC. And that's just because there are a lot of very rare variants out there, and you're always going to be sampling some very rare variants. And so we, we know that there's a, a left skew on, for rare variants, and we want to take that into account. And so we can't, because there's a, these, there's a left skew and it's not exactly a Poisson, what, we, what Nikki and Eric did um, is they said, this is the nomad allele frequency here, whatever this number is. And then they developed different, and they said, what Poissons would fit that this would be the 95% upper confidence interval? And then we'll make the middle of that the filtering allele frequency. So it's kind of saying, it's back estimating based on, your 95% confidence interval, kind of. So it's, and so your, your actual allele frequency you're using for filtering will be a little bit uh, less, a little bit rarer. And so you're going to keep some, a few more variants in with this approach. Does that make sense? OK. And we don't do this on global. We actually do this on each of the continental ancestries. Um, so that's important. We don't use um, Ashkenazi, Jewish, or Finnish, which are founder effects. We don't use those populations. Um, and we also, again, as I mentioned before, don't recommend the subcontinental populations for this type of filtering. 
So on each page we, of the Nomad, each, each variant page in Nomad, we have the POTMAX filtering allele frequency. And so that's, we have it separately for exomes and genomes because all of the data is separate. I really would love one number. I generally recommend using the exome data just because there's more exome data and so generally it's the better thing to use, but I would use kind of whatever is the higher allele count. Um, but if you're just gonna use one thing, I, 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 I would use whichever has the higher allele count, which you can stop informatically or, or you can just use the exome data. If you hover over it, you'll see which population we're using for the pop max. You can also see in the table. The browser has the 95% kind of confidence interval level, and the VCF has both 95 and 99, so you can choose which you use. Okay, so then you're gonna take this number, taken that number, and I compared it to the number we calculated earlier, and then you have to be careful here because if you're not comparing six to four, you're comparing four times 10 to the negative four against six times 10 to the negative five, so this is smaller. So this, uh, this is true that your filtering allele frequency is higher than your maximum credible population allele frequency. And so you were able to um, discard this variant as too common to be pathogenic. And I will kind of take a step back and say, um, when I say retain a variant, um, rarity is necessary but not sufficient for pathogenicity. And over here, when I say discard a variant, what I mean is assign BS1 that is too common in controls. But if, you, if it's in a disease relevant gene, you probably wanna do a little bit more than that. If you're just kind of filtering your whole exome, you, well, we obviously don't go into great detail with every variant in an exome. Um, but basically, because this was in a disease-relevant gene, we're thinking about cardiomyopathy, we would curate it further. So I would give it BS1 too common in controls based on the fil frequency filtering approach, and then I would see what else we know about it. It also gets BP5, which is that an alternate cause has been found in several cases, which is known from um, diagnostic labs that have this data it's, or, or looking in the literature and things like that. But diagnostic labs have reported this into ClinVar that there are alternate causes of disease found in several cases. Additionally, nobody has any segregation, segregation data showing that this variant tracks with um, cardiomyopathy and no functional data is available. So based on BP5 and BS1, there's a calculator you use to figure out how you add these criteria up in terms of weighting, and this now gets a likely benign classification. Is that at the whole gene level? Because there's now several genes where the exome is in one disease uh, that's mutated, and there's exome mutations in another disease, whereas this looks at the whole thing in terms of... This is at a variant level, not a gene level. Question? Sorry, I actually... So you're asking if the you're doing this assertion at the gene or the variant level? That's what I was asking you, which one you're using here. Because there are many diseases now that one gene causes two very different diseases, right. where you're eliminating that as a possibility, but depending upon which exome it's in, at what level are you resolving whole gene or variant? So this is um, this is a variant. This is a I'm assessing whether this variant uh, is associated or causing this specific phenotype. And I would do in a different assessment for every phenotype I considered because the, allele, the genetic architecture and the penetrance might be different for each disease. And so this, every assertion is done specifically for a variant considering a specific phenotype or disease. So it's yeah. Okay, yes. For this one, would you try to do, a, or is that in a number of patients, and do a statistical analysis to see if there's a variant mutation on that? Right. So, calculation, and maybe you can estimate what the penetrance could be, maybe much lower. Right. Yeah. So I'm getting asked about using more of a case co a case control study because you have a. I did talk about having sort of a cohort here. I don't actually have that cohort, so I just know what was reported in ClinVar about this variant. Um, but if you have a cohort, then absolutely doing kind of a case versus control study is a great thing to do. Um, and the second part was um, can, thinking about the penetrance. So two things, I could have played with the penetrance and said even if I lowered the penetrance with that still, and those numbers that I gave you for the FAF and for the um, maximum credible allele frequency were pretty far apart. So even if I had lowered the penetrance a lot, I don't think that would have changed my interpretation. But you can also think about estimating penetrance of, like how penetrant a variant could be for disease based on how often you see it in Nomad. Um, and that's a more complex calculation, but something that people are, are doing with this data. It's very interesting. And not, I don't have time to go more into that, but 
I want to quickly talk about constraint. I have like very little time left, so I'm going to fly through this, but this is work by Caitlin Samoha. Conrad Kravchevsky has developed the new constraint um, scores that I'm going to talk about today, and then Mark Daly and Daniel MacArthur work on this. Um, Caitlin has an excellent primer on the model that underlies this, so I recommend checking that out if you're interested. Okay, so the, the idea here is we know about conservation across species. Constraint is, is how conserved something is within the human species, basically. And so if you have two genes, one that's very tolerant to variation and one that is very constrained, intolerant of variation, where variation causes disease, those are going to look different when we look in the general population. Mutations are going to arise in both of those genes in the general population by chance at the same rate, basically. Um, if they're similar genes. Um, and so the difference is in a tolerant gene, a lot of that variation will get passed on because it won't cause a problem. And a constrained gene, most of that variation is deleterious and does not get passed on. And so when we look today, what we're gonna see is tolerant genes have a lot of variation, constrained genes have very little variation. And Konrad Karczewski has developed a metric called observed over expected, which just says using Caitlin's mathematical model of how, much, how many variants we should see in each gene, of a data set this size, and then he counts up how many we actually see, and we just use this observed over expected, and we say what, what percent of expectation do we observe in NOMAD. This is really cool because for 70% of genes um, that are depleted for loss of function variation, we actually don't know the human phenotype yet, and so there's, this highlights a lot of genes um, that are probably underlying interesting human biology. Um, the NSD1 gene causes SOTO syndrome. It's an intellectual disability gene. It's a well-described papal insufficiency um, syndrome. And so the observed over expected is 0.04. Um, we also can look at missense variation. So we expect 1,500 here. We see 1,000, and so we see about 70% of expected. Um, and I'm going to, I mentioned that because I'm going to go into that into a little more detail. So again, so this basically um, is a constrained gene, but I want to give some important notes on constraint. It's for dominant disease genes. Um, we don't expect to see a strong constraint single for, signal for recessive disease genes. Occasionally, there's some signal. Um, it's, you don't have to have a super strong phenotype. You, can, you just have to have some degree of negative selection. Um, but the selection has to occur before the age of fertility. So for example, for BRCA1, which is a hapal insufficient uh, risk of autosomal dominant breast and ovarian cancer, we know that this is a this is a true disease association, I'm not questioning that at all, but you don't see that this is constrained for loss of function variation because much of the breast cancer onset is post-fertility. Um, so I'm going to, again, recommend Caitlin's um, talk to go through most of this, but this data is all here on the browser. Um, if you were to, there's two other features you can find on the browser. You can look at all the different transcript and you can see the gene expression there. Um, the gene expression is over here. And the other thing you can do is regional missense constraint. If you just look at the exact data set, it's only listed on that part of it. Um, but you can see regions of the genes that are depleted for missense variation. And so I'm just going to skip through all of that. Sorry, guys. Um, and Decipher is another site that represents this in kind of a different way and shows you the domains. And I just wanted to point that out because I like it. OK, so on the NOMAD site, we have a frequently asked questions. Um, I recommend checking that out for a lot of information. We have a contact. We have a GitHub if you find um, uh, browser issues. And you can also report a variant if you think that the, there's, and this is on each variant page, if you think that there's something um, going on with that variant. Um, so I hope I've convinced you today that reference population databases are very powerful. It's really important to review the read data and coverage. Uh, frequency filtering is a really great approach to a very more robust sequencing, or sorry, more, more robust um, filtering approach. I briefly talked about constraints, and I'm sorry that I didn't have time to go through that in more detail. And then I just wanted to mention that we are excited and we expect in this year that we're going to have a larger um, whole genome version of Nomad V3 coming out. And also, there's a structural variant reference call set that's in progress, and we hope to have that on the browser coming in this year, too. So more exciting things to come. Um, and then I just want to acknowledge Daniel MacArthur, who's now joined us. Um, so you can ask him all of your questions also, but um, he's led this whole project. And that this is a great resource for the community, but it's brought to you by a large team that works very hard. And I also want to call it the whole data sciences platform, all the Nomad PIs, and the Hale team who created a, a, a data system that let this whole um, data set be, to be built and analyzed. And without Hale, we wouldn't have been able to do any of this. Um, so I suggest you check it out. And it's really great for doing uh, analysis with this data set and other large genomic data sets and the broad for funding. Great. Thank you.